welcome to our January 6th, 2021 edition of Community Circles in Conversations. It's great to be back together this year and look forward to continuing our conversations. So um, let's roll to the next slide. And great. And if um, we can just review again, our goals for this series are to build trusting relationships, share knowledge and resources with the Central Iowa nonprofit sector. When we meet together, we are intentional about centering our dialogue around common goals and remaining rooted in equity and inclusion. And a housekeeping note for those joining us, please, if you would, um, turn off your video during the presentation and mute yourself. Um, and then we'll be able to um, invite you to turn those back on um, when we return. So Eric, I think you still have your video on, if you could turn that off. Um, if I have to turn them off for you, then it makes it a lot harder for you to turn them on yeah, for yourself. Eric's with, Eric's oh, Eric's with you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's a new face. Okay, Eric, you're fine. <laughs> you can stay. <laughs> Thanks. Great. All right. Let's, uh, let's roll to the next slide real quick. And then I can just uh, share some announcements and updates. So um, if you received our nonprofit link newsletter, I can make sure uh, to pop the uh, URL for that into the chat. We shared um, some information about the Then, Now, When series. Um, it's based on the 1619 Project. Uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones, uh, I think, will be having an event um, with the Des Moines community. I don't know if I should say in Des Moines or, uh, or not. Um, Angie, I don't know if you want to share anything uh, as you're joining us about the then, now, when, or 1619 or what people can look, uh, look forward to, but you'd be welcome to share a little bit more about that. Um, and then uh, we will, oh, let's see. I don't know if Angie's going to do that yet. Um, and then we'll be hosting our basics of being an effective board member, kind of our signature training on Tuesday, January 19th. Um, and then we will be um, meeting with our, oh, oh, we have somebody who's not on mute, so I'm going to mute them. Um, <laughs> we will be uh, hosting a grant making webinar for the second time on January 20th. We found that was really helpful last year to just give everybody a chance to learn more about our competitive grants and um, ask some questions. And so we'll be doing that again. Obviously, last year, things really changed after our grant making webinar, um, but we'll be looking forward to doing that again and kind of laying out what our 2021 priorities will be this year. So um, information on all of those is in our nonprofit link newsletter. Um, again, I will plan on um, linking that uh, here for you in just a minute. Let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, so Dustin and Eric from Nine Master Good are on today to share COVID relief legislation updates. Um, and then we will have a conversation and breakouts um, for the second half for those who can stay with us um, around board leadership and broadening the bench. I think, um, you know, we're part of some conversations around, you know, what can we do to better prepare um, board members who come from a wide variety of backgrounds. Um, we know that our nonprofit sector is stronger um, when we have deeper uh, diversity um, at that board level. So we'll be exploring some ideas and wanna hear from you around, you know, what are your organizations doing abroad in the bench and where are your pain points and progress? So we'll go to the next slide. And we will let Dustin and Eric take over. And if you guys need to share a screen or pull anything up, feel free to do that. Um, let us know, but we'll, we'll let you take it away. Thanks for being back with us. It feels yeah. like, uh, feels kind of weirdly like March having you back. I don't know. I'm, I'm happy to see you though, Dustin. I, I feel like the last eight months, it's, it's kind of felt that way anyway, right? Uh, trying to figure out which day we're on. And I am trying to share my screen uh, and we have some slides uh, that, that hopefully you can, Great. You can see. Yeah, well, I think if you, you will be able to do that now, we just there stopped we sharing ours. There we go. Great. And I'm going to go through and mute some of our folks who are on the line okay. who haven't turned off theirs. So if you get muted before we go, 
to um, breakouts. Just maybe test it. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, go ahead. Yeah, and <clears throat> yeah, as, as you say, it's it's been a while, um, and sorry, uh, under the circumstances, we're still all dealing with these and these relief packages, but uh, as Brianne said, it, it is nice to see familiar faces, uh, and, and I think we're in the home stretch here uh, where we'll get to see one another hopefully, uh, hopefully soon in person. Um, but I brought <clears throat> Eric Fisher with me, uh, who's another attorney, one of my partners uh, at Nymaster. He's really done um, the laboring or on the small business programs uh, for us. And so I wanted to make sure that people had a face and name uh, and his contact information will be on at the end. Um, and, and in fact, <clears throat> I know that Casey on my team is on there. Uh, and if Casey, if you could just throw in the chat, the three of us is um, uh, email and Casey Nickel, who will put that in, uh, she'll give you the email for all three of us. Uh, but it's probably easiest if you just contact Casey if, if you have a question um, for either Eric or myself. Um, but uh, Eric being uh, the, the go-to guy around our firm related to the business programs, he's the one best suited to help people understand really what has occurred um, since March uh, on these PPP, the, the Small Business Administration SBA programs, uh, and then what kind of changes we're anticipating. Um, it, it, he's the one that's most adept at telling you the frustrations, I think, um, in analyzing uh, forgiveness and things of that nature for those of you that have one and then are considering getting another one. But let's back up and look where we've been, it come from since March. Um, you know, what we saw in December in a relief package was really a combination of a consolidated, it's a, it was called the Consolidated Appropriations Act. So it was really a continuing resolution to keep the federal government going, plus a COVID relief bill. And you'll see those politics of that where <clears throat> some people are irritated of, of certain spending in other countries. That's just the nature of a very large uh, budgeting bill in connection with the COVID relief. I put this up here not to drag us all back through what we've been through since March, but I put this up here because when you start looking at, at the numbers, um, eventually what you get to in all the phases is, is close to three and a half trillion dollars that will have been spent for COVID relief, um, it, which is a, a ton of money. Um, but, you know, it continues to keep flowing, that it continues to prop up the economy. Um, but the, the tricky thing for a small nonprofit is, um, you know, hearing that another $900 billion is spent, um, what can I have access to? Um, are there programs that are new uh, that I don't, I don't want to miss uh, and I don't want to miss a deadline and I don't want to miss my chance to get the money? And so hopefully Eric and I can go through some of these programs and at least give you an idea of where to look. Um, and as always, you can feel free to reach back out to us and, and we can help you uh, on, on the specifics of the programs. The major points of the Consolidated Appropriations Act, um, one of the big things is a CARES Act, CARES Act extension. Uh, so the money that we saw in the spring, um, I know I, I interact with the governor's office pretty frequently and you know because we don't have large cities or counties, uh, all that money essentially ran through the governor's office. And there was a real worry about um, having some of that money, you know, not be spent in the state because the deadline uh, was December actually 30th, 2020. So that money has been extended. Um, and what you could imagine is all the money from the CARES Act was allocated, um, but certain people didn't access it or, you know, somebody didn't need as much as they thought. So at the end of the year, there was a lot of money still left over millions of dollars um, <clears throat> that needed to be reallocated. Um, and now the pressure isn't necessarily there that it has to happen. Um, it, so that money will still be there to, to assist state and local government entities. And some of those other programs that you're seeing from the governor that are coming from CARES Act, whether it's broadband, things of that nature, now there isn't as much a time pressure to get that out. As I mentioned, a continuing budget resolution, um, you know, when we've had split control, unfortunately, at the federal level, 
uh, we continue to operate in a space where they're not operating on a, a standard budgeting process. So you have to go through the terminology you'll hear as CRs or continuing resolutions. Um, and that was 1.4 billion, a trillion of, of that. Uh, better make sure I get my T instead of B in there um, because there's there's a difference. Um, and then this, this, this COVID relief is direct support for small businesses, employers, and employees to get this thing across the finish line. Some things um, fell off. The major portions were um, the Senate, uh, who the majority is Republican. Uh, the Senate Republicans didn't want, uh, or they really wanted um, kind of COVID uh, liability limitations, uh, and that was not included. But the House uh, Democrats, really we're looking for additional funding on state and local governments. Those two kinds of things fell off the table in the negotiations. Um, but there were certain other things that we had identified when we were, when we all worked together last spring and summer, um, you know, such as cultural venues, things of that nature that <clears throat> really weren't impacted well in the CARES Act funding that there's kind of some new programs there uh, for things that fell through the cracks. Um, and then finally, obviously lots of money for vaccine and distribution uh, to try and get uh, the vaccine out there and eventually uh, see some sort of uh, relief from uh, getting back to, to somewhat normal here in the next uh, few months. Uh, my understanding, just in case people are interested, my understanding is we will get tranches uh, on a pretty regular basis to be distributed um, and for a, a, a hopefully, uh, you know, we're seeing fits and starts across the country but hopefully late spring, early summer, uh, seeing a, a pretty wide dispersal of vaccine across the state. Um, but from here, I wanna kick it, as I mentioned to the expert, to Eric. Uh, I think the important thing for people to understand is Eric has been doing uh, our Paycheck Protection Program uh, work with our clients uh, for, for programs all the way back for the CARES Act. Uh, and so he had a pretty good understanding of what happened in the spring and summer with CARES Act, which means people trying to access their forgiveness. Uh, and then what does this new program look like? So go ahead, Eric. Um, can I pause just real quick, yeah. uh, Dustin, and ask, um, just lift up one of the questions from the chat. Yeah. Do you have any other information on the cultural fun related funding? Um, that yeah, might we'll get there. Okay. okay. Oh, that, perfect. That's in here. Yep. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Uh, like Dustin said, my name is Eric Fisher. I've been working on Paycheck Protection Program issues and, and CARES Act issues since uh, since the CARES Act passed on, on March 27th. Uh, so I've been spending a lot of time uh, with these issues, assisting clients from the, the application process all the way through now. Now, now folks are entering the, the loan forgiveness application process. So I've so been assisting people with uh, sort of all phases of the, of the program. And now we have a uh, I think it's referred to as the second draw paycheck protection program, and then some edits to the uh, original program as well, uh, along with $325 billion of additional funding. Um, so uh, in this new paycheck protection program, uh, priority is, is given to businesses that didn't receive funding in the first round. So if you recall, uh, the first time around, uh, the money went quite quickly, um, which caused a lot of anxiety for folks trying to get their uh, get a banker who would accept the application uh, and then process it in time to get the money, which resulted in, in some additional funding being available. Uh, here, because the, the, the channels are, are already existing to process applications, hopefully that same issue it does not occur. Uh, there are some expansions of, of eligibility to include 501c6 organizations, as well as news media organizations. Uh, there are some uh, limits uh, on the 501c6s with respect to legislative and lobbying activities. You can't have any more than 15% uh, of your gross receipts as a 501c6 from lobbying activity. Uh, and then you also can't have more than 50% of total activities uh, be from lobbying. And then there is also a cap on $1 million of lobbying activities, activities in the most recent tax year. And uh, seeing in the chat that that's correct, 501c3s have been and are included in the Paycheck Protection Program, along with uh, with traditional business entities and sole proprietors, so corporations, limited liability companies, uh, partnerships, um, 
and, and so the, the the funds are available to those organizations as well. The 501c6 nonprofit is a, a new category. Uh, news media organizations are are also newly eligible, um, and, and there are there are uh, certain uh, uh, limits on that as well. Uh, so you, you can either have a license by the FCC and has less than 500 employees, uh, or is a nonprofit operating as a public broadcasting company. Um, or um, that is, you can have a newspaper publisher or a radio network or television broadcaster that makes a good faith certification um, that the proceeds of the loan will be used to support the the portion of the business that distributes information related to uh, the pandemic. Uh, so that that is still a, a little more up in the air about what that's going to look like. We haven't seen these these new uh, paycheck protection program applications yet. Uh, and in the act, it, it did it did include a requirement that SBA issue guidance related to the second draw program uh, 10 days from the uh, from the signing of the act. So uh, we should have that information soon. I don't know that that's going to include the the applications, but we should have information soon. Uh, and, and I guess you can see based on the, the speed with which the the second round of stimulus checks were delivered uh, in a matter of days rather than in a matter of weeks. I think hopefully this time around the program should work smoother uh, and be easy to access, easier to access for folks. Um, there was additional relief for farmers and ranchers. So uh, the act was amended to permit farmers uh, to base their loan amount on gross income instead of net income, uh, which is a, a significant benefit for uh, for the farmers here in the state. Uh, an, another another update is a streamlined forgiveness process for borrowers of less than $150,000. Uh, so previously, there had been a, a streamlined process for those borrowers of less than $50,000, uh, both in terms of the time and the deliverables with the loan forgiveness application. Uh, another nice feature of the streamlined process is it is it, it is processed more quickly. Uh, so obviously, when, when you have the outstanding loan, uh, when, when you don't know whether it's going to be forgiven, that's that's something that can cause anxiety for people. So uh, making sure that that uh, or seeing that forgiven in a relatively expedient process is is a benefit to those small businesses with loans of less than $150,000. And with that, the only thing they're going to be required to provide on that application is uh, the amount spent on payroll, the, num the estimated amount of the jobs saved, and a certification that, uh, that the amounts were spent as required. Uh, another update in the, in the legislation is a clarification of uh, uh, language in the CARES Act. Um, so the IRS had taken the position that the expenditures using Paycheck Protection Loan Program funds were not tax deductible, um, which reduced the benefit to, to borrowers uh, in, in a fairly significant way. Uh, the CARES Act reversed that position um, and then also provided that pass-through entities, LLCs, uh, partnerships uh, would not receive a reduction in basis uh, in, their, in, their, in the basis of their, their partnership interest based on uh, the loan forgiveness. There's also an expansion of the permitted uses. Uh, so four new categories, we got covered operations expenditures, covered property damage costs, covered supplier costs, and cover work, worker protection expenditures. Uh, covered operation exp expenditures includes uh, business software, uh, other software processes, um, inventory records, supply software. So it's, it's main, mainly a, uh, a, a software focused uh, category, but but there are other, other other items depending on the nature of your your business. That one is somewhat broad. And I think we need some additional clarification on uh, what can be included there. And these are these are additional items in adi uh, in addition to the payroll costs, uh, covered mortgage interest uh, payments, covered rent obligations uh, from the initial from the initial paycheck protection program. Uh, so we've also had the addition of covered property damage. Uh, those are uh, costs related to property damage and vandalism or looting uh, related to public uh, disturbances, unrest uh, that happened in the summer of, of 2020. Uh, so I, I think there are, are certain communities in the country that that, that obviously impacts a lot uh, uh, more than than maybe they do here in Central Iowa. But certainly there might have been some folks who who sustained property damage as, as a result of uh, of some unrest that may have occurred. Um, and, and so those would now be covered costs, uh, covered supplier costs. Uh, so these are expenditures to suppliers of goods that are essential to operations. Um, 
and, and are made pursuant to a written contract. So if you if you're producing uh, some item and there are essential inputs to that item, as long as you've got a written contract, Paycheck Protection Program funds can now be expended for for that purpose. Um, and then finally, covered worker protection exp expenditures. This is PPE, the, the fiberglass, uh, building outdoor uh, dining structures. If you're if you're in the hospitality industry, uh, it, a broad category of expenditures. Uh, that that rewards employers and, and businesses, nonprofits that uh, that spent the money to, to keep their their employees and staff safe. Uh, so with those new categories, uh, the permitted expenditures are now quite broad as opposed to narrow with the original program. So most expenditures that businesses would be making would now be included. But you do want to check to make sure uh, that that the expenditures that you're submitting would be. Uh, forgivable, and all of those would, would, will likely receive additional guidance on and clarification. Um, and then uh, the the act also required SBA to deliver an audit plan within 45 days of the passage of the act. So SBA is going to review or audit all loans in excess of two million dollars, and then some other loans. Um, but they're they're going to deliver a, an indication of how that audit is going to take place within the 45 days. So there's a lot of uncertainty for those borrowers that are that are going to be subject for audit about what that's going to look like. Eric, before Definitely we move on to the next slide. slide. Yeah, when we move to the next, before we move to the next slide, um, that expansion of permitted uses, just a clarification for people, that's just for new loans, correct? Or does that's that- correct. Okay. Should be up. I switched the slide. Okay. Oh, dang it. Uh, so we also have a, a second draw PPP loan. So the uh, there are PPP loans available for borrowers who previously uh, have obtained a loan, and there there are requirements for or uh, different limits on on the availability of those of those loans. So uh, the second draw PPP loans are available for for borrowers that have less than 300 employees or less than 300 employees per physical location. If you're in the hotel, restaurant, or uh, bar industry, generally, if you have an NAI CS code 72 uh, business. Um, and then you also are required to have experienced a 25% decline in gross receipts during one quarter of 2020 compared to that same quarter in 2019. So this is more targeted relief. Um, in the uh, initial program, it was based on uncertainty. You didn't know what was going to happen. You had concerns about how your business was going to operate, continue to employ folks. Here, we have a look back test that says, well, we actually have experienced this pretty significant decline uh, in, in revenue compared to 2019. And, and we do need assistance to be able to get through, uh, hopefully, the, 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 short, the short rest of this pandemic. Uh, there is a cap on loan size of $2 million, if you, if you recall, in the the, the first tranche, it was, it was $10 million. It's calculated two and a half times um, monthly payroll, except for those uh, those, those hotels, restaurants, uh, and bars. So those are they're going to be three and a half times monthly payroll. Uh, there are also some some new prohibitions, and these apply the, these prohibitions apply to all new loans and second draw loans, uh, so that no publicly traded companies are uh, eligible going forward. And there are restrictions on on individual or companies, borrowers with affiliations with China or Hong Kong from receiving loans. So to the extent you have uh, significant investment, uh, ownership, board members uh, from China or Hong Kong, uh, you'll, you'll want to make sure that uh, you're checking with um, with with counsel or your accountant before applying applying for that loan. And then some changes were also made to the uh, uh, e EIDL grants and uh, loan programs. So there's $20 billion for new EIDL grants for businesses, uh, specifically in low-income communities. There's also a change to the, the PPP program related to those EIDL grants. Formerly, those grants had been uh, taken off of your eligible uh, PPP loan amount. Uh, that's no longer the case. So you're eligible for the full PPP loan amounts, um, as well as the EIDL grant. That's a pretty significant uh, change, especially at the smaller borrower level, level 
So those individuals maybe employing one, two, three people or sole proprietors, uh, that $10,000 amount being reduced off of the PPP loan was a significant uh, uh, si significant change. So, so nice to see that changing moving forward. Uh, and then some additional funding for uh, uh, continued SBA debt relief payments. Thanks, Eric. Uh, the other things that we saw in here, this was uh, one of my references earlier, is uh, clearly they wanted to get some uh, funding out for those uh, venues that were unable to operate uh, basically since March. Uh, this Save Our Stages Act is $15 billion. Uh, and the little agency that could, uh, the Small Business Administration, is uh, also tasked with this in addition to PPP and everything that, that Eric just uh, identified. Um, part of my concern with that, for those of you that are looking at this, uh, is that it's a new program. Uh, so we will be needing new guidance and, and rules to see how this money will come out. Um, but you can see that the focus of it is uh, it's crafted in a way to essentially avoid large uh, movie theater franchises, essentially. Um, but the key is for those venues, um, which I know that we've spoken with a lot, a number of uh, people on this group uh, where this would apply, uh, don't have a ton of guidance at this point as to how this will come out. Uh, but I did want to share with people that we will be seeing it through the SBA uh, as that. Eric, did you have anything to add there? I, I did not add a clarification on the, the previous question you had asked. Wanted to clarify that those covered oper the, the new categories of PPP expenditures, they apply to existing PPP loans that haven't been, the forgiveness application hasn't been submitted in addition to uh, the second draw loans. So just wanted to provide that clarification. Yeah, that's important too, because I think what we've seen is, is some people didn't think that they would have, uh, the, they didn't come up with the expenses that they thought they had in their application. So that's why I wanted to clarify that. So for those of you that have a major forgiveness application, this is a way to, to, to boost your forgiveness to the full amount that you were anticipating. Uh, broadband and transportation, $7 billion is going towards broadband funding. Uh, and you can see the, the specific carve outs within that for telehealth and rural. Um, I was involved in the stimulus in 2010 in DC. Basically, this is a uh, will be a dance in a in a territorial fight between the Department of Commerce and the Department of Agriculture uh, over how this money gets spent. Uh, but depending upon where you're at, uh, you'll look for applications. The programs will likely be similar to what we saw in the 2009 stimulus. Uh, so for those of you that are interested in, you know, broadband expansion and applications, uh, it will come through the Department of Commerce. Uh, the program is called BTOP, uh, and I, that's the acronym, and USDA's will be the Broadband Incentives Program, which they call BIP. On the transportation side, this is much more direct assistance uh, to local municipalities, states, uh, and specific industries, uh, very similar to what we saw in the CARES Act. Uh, obviously, the airline industry uh, is still uh, seeing some pretty significant impacts uh, and will likely need to change how they operate moving forward. On the individual side, uh, uh, hopefully you got your, your payment uh, in, in your check, as Eric mentioned, in days and not weeks. Uh, obviously, this was similar to what we saw with the CARES Act happy. Um, but uh, what we saw uh, where in the 1200 uh, in the CARES Act with, you know, a 500 per child, this was just strictly a 600. Uh, and then we saw the dance between the uh, between the president and, and uh, the Congress before signing of wanting a 2000. That was actually something that House Democrats had wanted in the negotiation. Uh, but ultimately what they landed on was 600 per person, including children. One, one thing of note, if you're advising um, you, you know, clients or, or people using yours, uh, if, you, if they didn't get it, um, you, you can still apply for these in when you file your taxes for 2020. Uh, that's an important note. Uh, I know that our tax guys at the firm have had that situation where you know, maybe a, a child was not included on one 
uh, in their 2019 returns. So with this automatic nature of, of the money, uh, you still can go in your 2020 uh, tax and, and uh, get your stimulus, uh, which is an important feature of that as well. On the unemployment benefits side, this was a question about the cultural side and I went through save our stages. Uh, the new uh, unemployment benefit extension does continue to uh, include the pandemic unemployment assistance, which is, this is really that gig economy. Uh, I need to, we, we uh, Chris Kramer, the Bravo folks uh, and the foundation, we were all uh, trying, working feverishly with Senator Grassley and Senator Ernst and I need to do some more digging to, to understand whether or not um, they made some of those changes. I know that we'd had some serious frustrations with, with some folks from this uh, group uh, about needing, you know, covered wages maybe being 10% of somebody's income, um, which really impacted uh, whether you could, the PUA was actually Im impactful. Um, so I, I need to look and make sure that those changes, rather than the 600 additional uh, that we saw, this will be a new $300 uh, dollar bump through March 14th. And one other thing in there is, uh, you know, ensuring that people aren't getting uh, unexpected billings uh, related to medical expenses for directly related to COVID during this time period as well. On the tax relief side, I'm not going to go into major detail, but there's a, a huge amount of chain, a huge amount of uh, benefits for people on the tax side uh, for their filings for 2020. Iowa specific uh, victims of derecho will will have um, specific tax relief that they'll be able to 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 draw from uh, in their filings this year. Uh, the tax credits, some of this stuff uh, is related to what was extended in phase three of uh, or phase two, the Families First Corona Virus Relief Act. Uh, some of these tax credits are extended uh, based upon. Uh, based upon uh, obviously the, the uh, pandemic extending through 2021. There's also adjustments to child care tax credit, ch child tax credits and EITC um, for the consideration of uh, lower incomes in 2020, uh, which may impact some folks here on the phone as you advise your, your clients. Uh, Craft Beverage Modernization Act, th these were things again related to uh, we knew that uh, the breweries were, were making a lot of hand sanitizers and things of that nature. It's, it's helped for their tax exclusions for student loan payments by employers. Uh, they created an extension of the charitable giving deduction uh, boost, meaning that uh, when they, in the 2018, uh, maybe it was 17, 2017 uh, federal income uh, tax bill, uh, basically charitable giving uh, because of the boost in the standard deduction was really kind of useless uh, for, for, many bar, for many taxpayers. This gives you a charitable deduction irrespective, and it's fairly small, I think $600, um, but it, it, gives a, it gives a boost uh, irrespective of uh, whether or not you're doing a standard deduction or itemized. Also gives a business meals deduction. Again, this goes back to Eric's point of there seems to be a lot of focus on the, the hospitality industry uh, and this trying to encourage people to um, uh, get out uh, get out and, and buy from restaurants and, and and get a reimbursement for that within your taxes and then some five year sunset extensions on some other tax credits uh, uh, within within this bill on the child care side uh, ten billion dollars in grants to stabilize the child care sector this is one of those again where uh, this is new. So uh, how that will flow through the state uh, remains to be seen. Uh, typically, when you see money like this, uh, you know, I would look through existing channels or existing programs uh, as to how that will flow through the state. On the education side, this is very similar to, to what we saw in the CARES Act for the education relief. Uh, the focus on this money is obviously towards um, COVID response and mitigation. Uh, schools, as Eric mentioned, on the business side, schools have spent a lot as well trying to keep kids safe. Uh, nutrition assistance, uh, boosting of SNAP benefits for 15% uh, of 15% for the next six months. Uh, and I just looked this up to to ensure, and uh, for those of you that, that this might impact on the rental assistance side, they did 25 billion in emergency rental assistance 
and, and an eviction on moratorium. Um, I, I wanted to look up specifically how this will flow through. Uh, the assumption would be that it was HUD and some of this money does go through HUD section eight. Uh, however, this will be very similar to the state and local funding that we saw in the CARES Act where it will be pro rata by state so um, this, again, would be something you want to look towards the governor's office uh, as to, A, when they get the money, and then B, how they're going to utilize it. But I know, uh, at least from the stories I've heard, that you know there's significant people out there hurting on and, and backed up for a number of days, uh, a number of months um, uh, on their rent. Uh, so uh, I think it'll be more immediate that way, uh, actually. Uh, because the states, once they get the money in their coffers, it's it's typically easier to, to get that money out the door and will likely be lesser of an application to get it. Uh, on the agricultural side, you know, an additional uh, amount supporting farms and agriculture uh, and the biofuels producers um, based upon the amounts that have been lost through uh, refinery waivers. Uh, and last but not least, obviously, there's a ton of money out there related to uh, vaccine therapeutic diagnostic and, and getting our mitigation, our testing and vaccines out to people across the country. Uh, and with that, uh, Brianne, I think we could take questions or uh, end for the day for you. Great. Well, thank you so much, um, Dustin and Eric, for your expertise on this topic. It is really helpful to have you kind of walk through it with us. Um, I would welcome anybody in the chat to enter questions for Dustin and Eric, or you know, thank you for including your contact information here um, so that folks can follow up with you. But anybody have anything in the chat? Otherwise, we can start to transition um, into breakouts. So, um, oh, does rental assistance apply to nonprofits for rental payments? Is a question. Uh, it's it, the language is fairly broad. Uh, and did I, I didn't put myself on mute? Okay, good. Um, the language is fairly broad. Um, so this is one of those where we're going to have to identify. Um, how the state will utilize the funding. Um, so that's something that if, if um, nonprofits are interested, it's something I would, you know, contact the governor's office early about uh, as to how they're going to get that money um, uh, out throughout the, throughout the state. So um, there's no restriction in it in the federal act is what I would say. Uh, it's really determinant upon how the state wants to use it. And I see Angie's question here about timing for some guidance on Save Our Stages Act. Um, I would be checking SBA uh, regularly. I did this morning and didn't see anything new. Um, that's why you know I, I mentioned, Angie, that SBA utilizing it, um, that, that's part of my worry on a timing side is because PPP EIDL is all in place. Uh, so that money can get out as quickly as possible. Um, here, we're just gonna have to wait for um, for additional guidance. And I know the Iowa Arts Council has been a helpful partner in sharing some of that yes. information as well. A question from Michelle in round one of PPP, the SBA definition of payroll excluded independent contractors. Any change for round two? Not explicitly. I, I think the intent there is still that the independent contractors would apply for their own. Uh, either getting their an original one or a uh, it's possible that as we get additional guidance on covered operation expenditures that certain uh, independent contractor obligations would be covered there uh, but there wasn't a a broad category of including independent contractor payments for purposes of PPP but I think we can expect to see some of them uh, covered under those those new expanded categories but I would, I, I think we'd wait, need to wait and see additional guidance before we can say definitively which, which payments would be covered. Thanks. And then I see a question about broadband. Um, and so just following up on how that allocation is being spent locally, do you have any advice on where they could look? Yeah. So two things, first of all, to make a distinction, um, it's important to make a distinction between the federal and the state. This is federal money. Um, so, you know, basically in 2009, we saw $7 billion. Now we see another $7 billion 
But the important part of that is um, you really have to, um, uh, whether you live in an area, see it's Deborah's question, you know, if you live in an area of a rural telco um, or you're served by Windstream or CenturyLink, it's really up to them to make the application. Um, but part of uh, what is going on in the state, and this you can identify through state sites, is uh, broadband mapping and what's available. Um, but I think Deborah has rightly pointed out <clears throat> the that can be pretty uneven um, as to what's reality. Um, and I know that as, in my own household, I live a, two miles outside of a, a small rural community. Um, and what they say they have access to and what in reality I can get are two different things. But the big key here is, you know, checking with the person who is responsible for serving your area. As I mentioned, a rural telco, a municipal telco, uh, Windstream, CenturyLink, uh, Mediacom, um, and seeing if they're applying for some of those fundings. Thanks. Um, I see a few more questions. So I just wanted to call out if folks are interested in participating in a breakout room, just put a one in front of your name and we can start zooming you out so we meet your needs as well. I know some people like to come together and chat. So if you want to do that, we'll keep answering and addressing questions in this main room. But if you're interested in breaking out and talking about board diversity or anything that you want to really, um, just put a one in front of your name and Barb will get you zoomed out in into a room. So breakout room topic is really um, around board diversity and initiatives that your um, organization might be undertaking right now um, or questions that you have. So um, if you would start to just put a one in front of your name or even comment in the chat, we can start zooming people out for that. Um, and then continue in this main room with um, Eric and Dustin on some of these questions. So um, I had another question about uh, priority for PPP. I don't know if you have had a chance to address that yet. Sorry, I was checking the chat <clears throat> from May. Yeah, that, I, the thing I would say is, you know, Eric and I, um, until we see some of these other loans go out, um, I don't know. Um, it's difficult to, to, to predict uh, if somebody has one, you know, what's the likelihood of getting another. However, as Eric mentioned, I would say when PPP first came out in the CARES Act, you know, as Eric mentioned, that money went out, I think in less than 14 days, right, Eric? I mean, it was gone. The next round- I think it was like nine, nine days. Yeah, and the, the next round was much slower. Um, so, you know, and, and, you know, with the different restrictions that Eric went through, there certainly is, you know, limitation, you know, that initial, that initial tranche that went out, um, you know, it was broad and, and you know, some of the restrictions now that you're seeing on publicly traded companies and things like that is they really are trying to focus it on small people, uh, small businesses. Uh, so it's tough to predict that. Uh, however, I just think that the uh, while the need is great, the if you fit within that less than 300 person category, um, I just don't think it's going to be as fast uh, as that initial tranche. But you know, I wouldn't hesitate to get an application in as quickly as you can uh, with your banker uh, that you got your first one in. If it, yeah. Adding on Dustin's answer, to the extent that you're interested, I would just I'd go ahead and contact whoever whoever your banker is now. Now, even though the applications aren't available, just to let them know that you're interested in and begin the conversation. That way, when the application does uh, is available, you can quickly fill it out and, and submit it. And echoing Dustin's point, I think the the loans will likely be available for those that want them. There are carve outs for some initial first time applicants and some additional carved out funds for uh, minority and with women owned businesses, uh, which are both good to see, but I think there are still uh, hundreds of billions of dollars that are generally available. And, you know, a little shout out to Eric. Uh, if you check our website, uh, nymaster.com, he uh, typically, if there's new guidance out, uh, Eric is on the case and gets out on, uh, Put, puts a blog post out on new guidance or applications. 
Uh, so not only when he does those blog posts, uh, does he give you the application itself if it's new, but he'll give you somewhat of a breakdown uh, within our website as well. Great, couple more questions coming through. Um, I'll start from the bottom. PPP and Save Our Stages are mutually exclusive? Question from Matt, Matthew McGuire. No, they're, they're two separate things. So um, unlike, as Eric mentioned, the separate from EIDL and PPP, EIDL and PPP, those early on things where we saw this, you can either get this or you get this. Um, this doesn't seem to have the same restrictions. Great, thanks. Um, I see a question on in 2020 from Julie. In 2020, employers had to provide paid leave. Um, is this extended into 2021? That is correct. And our labor and employment attorneys would not want Eric and I to speak of this. So uh, there are uh, <laughs> there are blog um, posts on our uh, website from our labor and employment folks. Uh, that talk about this new, uh, the new extension and what it means. Great. Okay. And maybe we can. My, my understanding those. is that it is elective moving forward rather than required. But again, uh, neither Dustin and I are labor and employment attorneys, but my understanding is that it is subject to some restrictions, elective rather than mandatory. Uh, so to the extent you have questions or how to implement that program, or if you weren't required to do it the first time around, but want to see if it's now available, uh, as an elective choice, uh, uh, consulting our website or, or getting in contact with us and we can put you in contact with the right folks. Great, thanks. Um, and then uh, another question on the museums, any limitations or requirements? It sounds like there's still a lot yet to be determined on. Yeah, that. It, you know, I, if you're interested on the museum side, the best thing I can tell you is news is, is you're el going to likely be eligible um, but, you know, the big key would be is through your associations, um, as, as Brianne mentioned, you know, through Chris Kramer and the Bravo folks, you know, making sure that in their contacts with the governor's office um, and Department of Cultural Affairs that, that they're aware of the need and how you would fit within this um, program. Mm -hmm. But, you know, again, th those folks, as Brianne knows, have been great partners through this. Um, and so, um, you know, getting that information through the Bravo people um, and then specifically Chris Kramer, my guess is Chris is going to have a pretty good, uh, she'll be the one in the room, you know, structuring that when that hits the state's bank, uh, hits the state's uh, account. So, um, you know, stay, stay tuned, but at the same time, do your prep work um, with your associations and uh, with the Department of Cultural Affairs. Yeah, and I just popped the Iowa Department of Cultural Affairs um, URL into the chat and Chris Kramer, who Justin had mentioned, runs that um, department. So um, questions, additional questions? These are good. Anything, oh, I see another one. Um, opportunity for charitable deductions to be extended for 2021. So that was helpful for giving Tuesday annual appeals. So I think you had a, a bullet on that, but if you want to reiterate. Uh, I, I would have to look into it, but I mean, with uh, my guess is that Eric, and I don't know if you know more, my guess is that extension is for both. It was for your 2020 tax returns and will be for the 2021 tax returns. Is that your understanding? That's my understanding as well. Yeah. Yep. It, it just makes, I mean, just from a, it just makes sense if you're passing a bill on December 27th mm -hmm. um, or an extension, you know, it, it just makes sense that it would likely be on both. Mm -hmm. Great question. And, and honestly, you know, that's one thing I could look back to for the hospitality industry, you know, the business meal deduction, um, that, that's a big deal to try and get people back in to, to restaurants uh, in 2021, which uh, if, if, if you're anything like me and Eric, uh, you know, what we typically use for business expenses in 20, uh, in a year, uh, was very different, uh, this year. Yeah. <clears throat> Other questions coming through and, um, Dustin and Eric, I know you have uh, had a, a series of webinars that Nymaster has been putting on, kind of tracking this information, and you mentioned some blogs on your site um, as well. So um, do you expect, you know, just to continue to be 
kind of watching and, and disseminating information. And I'm, I'm on your site now, so I'll look and see if I can include some of those um, employment uh, posts. Anything else we should be looking for? Oop, all right. Yes, we've got a we, we've got a specific team that monitors uh, COVID nineteen related relief programs and and, and other COVID nineteen issues. Uh, so I'll be monitoring the the Paycheck Protection Program and other small business programs. And uh, I think I've got a, a blog post going up today on this uh, the changes in the second draw and the changes to the original program. And then there'll be subsequent posts based on when guidance is issued by by SBA and if, uh, if if the demand is significant enough or once those applications come out we, we may have another uh, another webinar if, if, if that's something that that folks are interested in but there'll certainly be uh, continue to be content related to COVID-19 on the website I think we have a a, a COVID-19 both a COVID-19 landing page specific landing page and then a, a paycheck protection program landing page as well so it's easier to find uh, all of that all of that content. In my main job um, is in government affairs, <clears throat> so I, I'm at the Capitol and interface with legislators in the governor's office. And one of the hats I have in that is I'm the also serve as the executive director of the Iowa Chamber Alliance. So you know I, I interface with the governor's office on a pretty regular basis, uh, and the people that are that are figuring out the programs. Uh, internally with whether the CARES Act money and then this new money I, I'm talking to on a pretty regular basis. So, um, you know, for those questions I see from Nick and others about the museums, uh, you know, I'll, I'll probably, you know, if, if you ping me, I, I don't mind because I, I'll probably have a pretty good sense as to how those things are going. And, and I think we do a pretty good job, right, Brianne, of if we get something new, getting it to you guys so that you can Absolutely. get it. Absolutely. We really appreciate your partnership. Um, and then I've seen a couple of maybe now would be a good time to kind of switch back to kind of what we have coming up on our uh, PowerPoint, Barb. Thank you so much, Justin and Eric. I appreciate your expertise and being with us. Um, so I've seen a couple of folks who just have some information um, on upcoming events. So Kristen, thank you so much for sharing the uh, virtual discussion on building equitable workspaces that Claudia Schabel is going to be hosting with YNPN Des Moines. Um, and then we will be working again with DSM Hack on a nonprofit Tech Connect event. Um, and so we are looking at um, some dates and what the needs are in the community. I know we hosted DSM Hack uh, at a community circle a couple of weeks ago, and they had some wonderful connections out of that event. And so we're looking to do something a little bit deeper. And I will go ahead in the um, in the nonprofit link um, that I shared earlier, I had that survey link um, around if you'd like to participate in the Tech Connect event and there is a specific survey monkey uh, for that so let me go ahead and um, include that in if you um, are looking to partner with some of those tech folks at dsm hack we can help um, bring you together that's our goal so um, any other questions or if you have events coming up and you'd like to share those events um, with us, you would be more than welcome to pop that in the chat. And again, yes, thank you so much to Dustin and Eric. We have a lot of appreciation in this virtual room um, for you really spelling everything out for us. Well, thank you. Great. All right. So thank I am, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I just wanted to say thank you. Wonderful. Thanks, Penny, for participating. Well, um, I w wish you all a wonderful week. Feel free to stick around, include your events um, or your additional questions in the chat. Um, but we will be moving to first Wednesdays of the month and we'll have information about our month by month specific topics out, um, hopefully within uh, the nonprofit link newsletter and then um, a reminder out to folks who've registered for the series. So we're trying to be timely in our topics. And so if you have specific ideas or questions or needs, feel free to communicate those with me and we'll work on um, arranging trainings around, uh, around those topics. All right, well, wonderful. Thanks. 
so good to see you all. I see MLK Day of Service, Alicia, ha Alicia has included. So more information on that. It's a day on, not a day off, as CYC I know always likes to remind us. Um, any other notes, feel free to pop them in. Otherwise, have a wonderful rest of your week. Thank you.